<clears throat> well, a very good evening to you. How's everyone doing? You know, when we ha everyone's doing fine, right? Let's get this new attitude when we start off our service from now on. Let's get it to be excited, okay? Let's not just like say, okay, we're gathered together. Let's get excited, right? We're here with the royal family. Where else is there to be except with the royal family of God? Well, a few things I want to make uh, known to you, and I think it's very important that you understand some of these things, but, you know, we've had, like, I think we had about, I don't know, maybe four or five, uh, I think, John, didn't you answer some phone calls from people that said that uh, we have in service? Someone else did. Who else did? Roy did, okay? People wanted to know if we're having service. Well, that, that's because of the weather. And what we're working on right now is that maybe if the weather's not that bad, if the streets are uh, not that clean, we can still have service. In fact, we've got a lot of things that we're trying to establish to make sure that we can have service, whether or not the weather's good or not, doesn't matter. I'm still gonna be here one way or the other. And so we have now been looking at something new. We're constantly looking at something new to actually make sure the Word of God is being taught in a positive way. And so as I mentioned to you on Wednesday evening, we do have some needs. I want to thank you for those of you, some of you who have given for those needs. We want to make sure that if I can't make it here, if the weather's that bad, maybe you can just stay at home with your wifey poo and your hubby poo, whatever it is, or maybe by yourself, which sometimes ain't that bad. Amen, somebody says. Amen. And uh, just get ready to study the Word of God. So. Uh, we're, we're, now we're now partaking of a new calling, and that calling is to now be able to set up a studio, which we've already done. I've taken out the entire second floor of uh, the parsonage, which I live, of course, I live in the first floor. And the second floor is now going to be dedicated to communicating the Word of God, so that if we can't make it for whatever reason, and if I can add certain doctrinal teachings, which I want to do as we study the book of uh, Obadiah, the book of uh, Malachi, the book of, uh, I don't know, the, we'll look at the book of Jonah. We'll look at all the Old Testament pro minor prophets. Uh, uh, Deacon uh, Robert DeVos said, can we study the book of Hezekiah? He just doesn't know that Hezekiah is not in the Bible, but that's all right, Robert. I'll teach you that. He's still a guy, but he's not in the Bible, but just picking on you. Anyway, isn't it good to be alive? I'm in a good mood tonight. Are you? Hopefully you'll be in a good mood by the end of service, but uh, we did ask for the fact that we are going to make some new uh, changes, and we want to get that uh, the... the um, the ministry going forward once again and having a studio at the house that we now have. We're going to take advantage of the entire second floor as much as we can, and we do need your help. I need someone, by the way, if you know anyone who's good at um, carpentry work, right now we need to have a pulpit built, and uh, we want it to be something that's going to be classy and good. But I've gone online, and some of the, I mean, they're charging between $1,500 and $2,000 to have a pulpit built. We don't need that much of a, we don't need that much uh, uh, wood to have a pulpit built. So if there's anyone here this evening that has uh, the gift, a gift of actually being able to build something with your hands, uh, please see one of the deacons. Let them know that you're available to do something like that. We want it to be top-notch. We'll pay for everything so that you don't have to pay for the wood unless you desire to do so. But we do want to have a pulpit built. And I went online. It's between like uh, $800 to $1,500. And I think we can do it for a lot cheaper. But we still need, we have, we have a, a need. And we're going to give you these needs uh, slowly but surely so that you don't get are discouraged by it because we need like two computers by the way we're going to show you why we need those and they're going to give us the opportunity to do some fantastic things with editing and my daughter is going to make sure Samantha is going to make sure that she does a great job with that so that we can have a nice presentation and then not only are we going to have the editing available for you but we're going to have a lot of other we're going to have Q&A's available for you we're going to have doctrinal books available for you that we basically may not study here face to face but it's going to be available for you to study it if you desire to do it from your home 
And so we do have some needs, and I want to share those needs with you. We've already received some help with this, but we can't do it without your help. Unfortunately, for those of you who may not like it, everything costs money, and we do need some finances to help us with it. We've already received some. We need three microphones that are in, going to be in top quality, by the way, top quality uh, material, because right now I'm still, I still got my old uh, microphone on me, and I had to cut another one of my $50 shirts. I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining, it's just kind of funny. I had to cut one of my shirts, it's got a slit in it so that my microphone won't fall, like it has been falling in the last, what, six months? Every so often it falls and I get really upset. So now I'm just cutting my shirts, putting my microphone inside the shirt. So if you see some guy roaming around in Somerset or Swansea and he's got like a microphone attached to him, that would be me. And so I just bear with that because we're gonna go forward with the plan of God no matter what, amen? And so we still have a need. I told you we're gonna tell you these needs. Like I said, we have a need for a pulpit. Uh, we do have a need for two computers that are coming up. I'm not going to give them to you yet because we don't know what the exact uh, price is, but we still need the microphones that almost come up to $1,740. They're top quality mics, and they want to... I want to give God the highest and best, right? I mean, where else should we spend our finances in? Our own home that's going to be burnt, or how about having our treasure be from heaven? and setting ourselves in our heart with treasure to heaven because that's the only treasure that really counts. And I want this house of God to be the best that we can. So once again, I'm letting you know what our needs are. If you'd like to help us in any way, now's your time to do so. And uh, you can do whatever you want. I just want to make these things available because as my, one of my, my oldest son, Bobby, said, you know, but Dad mentioned sometimes, even though I don't like you to mention you don't like to mention it, but you have not because you what? Ask not. And so therefore, we're just asking and telling you what our needs are. If you want to help us out with it, you may do so. If not, you just can simply go in your own direction, and I've got no problem with that, but I'm not going to uh, get up here and be a beggar. I'm just going to merely tell you what our needs are, and I thank you. I thank all of you who are here from our face-to-face -face congregation, those who are non-face-to-face -face congregation, because I'll tell you what, if it were not for our non-face-to-face -face congregation, I'm still not sure we, we, we would even still be here. But I am sure about one thing. God blesses us, doesn't he? And whether it's face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face, -face, we are just as important to God as anyone else. So let's begin to have another great year, the beginning of this new year, 2017, and watch God bless. I made some predictions. Many of them are probably basic predictions, but they have more detail attached to them, as you will see as we continue to grow in God's grace and knowledge. You'll see some of these things coming to pass. But before we do that, let's take our moment of silent prayer as we normally do to give us the opportunity to make sure that we are in fellowship with God, naming and citing any known sins, thanking God for the privilege and opportunity to serve him, casting all our cares upon him, forget about our problems and our difficulties, and thank God we have the ability and the privilege of going through whatever we go through in life because of him. What greater time to suffer for him than in this life because it's the only time we can express our gratitude and our love toward him. Amen? I said amen. 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 Therefore, let us pray. The word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. <coughs> All scriptures God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this evening to the book of Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 
Exodus, the 16th chapter. What an amazing time it is for us to just say, you know what, God, I'm going to cast all my cares upon you because you do care for me. And I'm going to go forward in your plan in spite of all the distractions and the principles that we have to go through at times, knowing that all I have to do is name and cite my sin, and you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and then to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So with that in mind, we've already noted the principle of the importance of rebound. Let's get right into the study of the Word of God this evening. I want to begin with the principle that I think I left off with on Wednesday, but I want to uh, reiterate this principle again. It is amazing how dissatisfied people will pick up on anything in their life to add to their dissatisfaction. Notice the principle again. It is amazing how dissatisfied people, people will pick up on anything to add to their dissatisfaction. Instead of saying, I'm so grateful and thankful that I can give thanks in all things to the Lord, they concentrate on what they are going through. If they, and what we're going to see this evening, beginning with Exodus 16, 13, talking about the children of Israel. Again, the principle, if they had more meat, more quails, they would say, we want more manna. If they had more manna, they would say, we want more what? More quails. You just cannot satisfy uh, implacable people. Look at Exodus 16, 13, because remember what they had every morning, noon and night, whether it was the noon time, whether it was the morning, whether it was the night time. We read in Exodus 13, 16, 13. It came about at evening. Notice that the quails came up and covered the camp. They wanted quails, by the way. They wanted meat. They wanted food. So God said, I'm going to give you that. And so it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. Notice they had quails and they had dew. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness or the desert, there was a fine flake-like thing fine as the frost on the ground. Of course, this is a reference to manna. When the sons of Israel saw, saw this, they said to one another, what is it? Notice that phrase. What did they say? What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread, by the way, the food from heaven. It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. You see, no matter what you do for these people, or no matter what you do for implacable people, you will never satisfy people in your life. The day that you wake up and you realize that there are people in your life, whether they're, whether they're family members, whether they're your friends, no matter who they are, the day that you wake up and realize that no matter what you do for some people, you'll never be able to satisfy them, so stop trying to do so, because it will totally cause you frustration. In fact, one philosopher put it like this. He says that the weakest and most fearful individuals in life, I think I gave you this on Wednesday, I'm not sure, but again, he said that the weakest and most fearful individuals in life are the revengeful, I want to get even, and the implacable. You cannot satisfy them. If you've been around people, by the way, who cry and who whine and who mew and who complain, well, you can understand exactly what's going on with the Jews at this particular time. The principle is simply, uh, simply this, and by the way, it's a major principle we study many times when it comes to the doctrine of contentment. If you are dissatisfied about one thing in your life, notice I said one thing, because that reveals what your attitude is. If you are dissatisfied about one thing, you're going to end up being that dissatisfied about what, above how many things? Everything. Because you see, you cannot satisfy some people. When you are dissatisfied about what God is doing in your life, think about it. You get up in the morning, and I, I, every morning I get up, and I, in fact, in, I've been doing this in the evening. I've been saying, God, when I wake up tomorrow morning, would you please remind me to be thankful that I can see, that I can hear, that I can walk, that I can talk? 
Would you thank you? Would you remind me I should be thankful about the people in my life that I have? In fact, last night I even asked God to remind me to be thankful for all of you, members of my congregation. Why? Because I am truly thankful for you. I really am. No matter how you may uh, think, or no matter what you may think about me, I am truly thankful that I have people in your life, people in my family. I was watching my son, John Madeira, Deacon John Madeiras. You know, I brag about him now and then but I was watching him. He's shoveling my driveway last night and today. He's shoveling my walkway last night and today, and he's making sure I don't fall uh, down. Now I asked him, I said, John, you, you treat me like a king. Why do you do that? He goes, because we don't have an insurance policy out on you yet, <laughs> which is a good answer, but isn't it good to have people like that in your life? I'm sure I have. I said I did the same thing with my son Bobby. What's going on down in the church? He goes, nothing, but uh, everything's okay. Yeah, Dad, don't worry. I'm going to take care of it and make sure you don't fall when you walk into the church door, the back door over here. And I said, isn't it fun to have people in your life who care about you, who love you? And do you realize right now, right, do you realize right now that there are people right now in your life? Look at that sad section right there. Look at it. There's no one there. Too bad for them, they miss out. Look at this section over here. This is not going to be called the godly section. That's going to be the ungodly section. But you know what? There's people in our life who love us. What greater blessing in life is that? What greater blessing do we have than that? And then added to that, I look at my granddaughter who came over, she walked through the snow today, came up my stairway, and she brought Papa his pills, his medication for today. And she said to me, oh, amazing. 13-year-old girl says, Papa, can I stay over tomorrow and watch a movie with you? And I said, it doesn't get better than this, does it? When your child and your grandchild still says, can I spend some time with you? Normally, we say, don't go too close because he's going to ask you to stay over. Mine said, can I spend some time with you? Does it get any better than that? It doesn't. And as you grow older, and I know I'm growing older, you're going to find out that that's one of the greatest blessings in life. What a blessing it is to be able to enjoy your children and your grandchildren and your friends and your loved ones growing up. Amen? Amen. And how sad it is for those that I love dearly who don't experience that. But you know what? It's only a matter of time before we reap what we sow. We invest in people's life, lives inevitably that comes back to us. And we grow up, we look in the mirror one day and we go, all those years when we woke up early in the morning, when everyone was sleeping and it was cold outside and it was snowing, and I got in my truck and you, the, the, the dad got in his car and we went to work and we went to work to provide for our family. And the mother got up and she made sure that her children were provided for. There comes a time, my friends, when all of that begins to have repercussions and benefits. And you say, it was worth every single second. Wasn't it? Brings tears to my eyes, so I better get back to the Word of God. But I've said for years that the greatest holiday, as I mentioned on Wednesday, is what I believe is Thanksgiving, where I can thank God for all my friends, family members, loved ones, children, and you, my congregation. It would not be Christmas if, uh, by the way, it would not be Christmas if uh, we did not have really the privilege of understanding that Christmas means that the Savior was born. I can enjoy Christmas now as never before, even though I know the world has taken that, that, that principle away. And to take individuals that are dissatisfied people, I have no idea why anyone of us should be dissatisfied. You see, there are people who are negative toward doctrine. It goes back to that. When you're negative toward doctrine, you're negative toward what? Life. If you don't love the Word of God, if you don't love the reason why you're here today, if you're negative toward God's Word, you're negative toward life. When you're negative toward life, you've got nothing to live for. However, I want you to see in Exodus 16, there's going to be a certain group coming on the scenes called the rabble. And not all the mixed multitude were involved, by the way. For, by the way, there's an individual who is an Ethiopian princess who will become the second wife of Moses. She's not 
not Jew Jewish, and she is the opposite of everything I've been talking about to you today. She is a fantastic person. And we're going to note the principle as we continue our study of what we call retrospective lust. What do I mean by retrospective? Retrospective simply means looking back on or dealing with past events or situations. Have you ever looked on back upon what you've gone through? Do you remember where you came from? Do you remember what you have gone through? Retrospective means there comes a time in our life when we look back, we deal with past events or situations. We will remember what we went through in the past. And this means that if you are dissatisfied about what you're going through right now, I don't care what it is. If you are dissatisfied about your present situation, it could be a lot worse, couldn't it? Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, and, and please do not get condemned. Get built up because of this, because many of you are sitting in the midst of people who love you and treat you as a brother and treat you as a sister in Christ and love to see you rejoice. But look what Peter said and how he said it. You've heard it many times about what we should do with all of our cares. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. He said, you younger men, notice what he says, 1 Peter 5, 5, are you there? You younger men or younger women, likewise, be subject to your elders, submit to them, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility, be humble toward one another. Because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the who? The humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may promote you or exalt you at the proper time. And here is how we humble ourselves. Casting all of our, what? Anxiety, our worries on him. Because he, what? He cares for who? He cares for you. Therefore, be of a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Be of a sober spirit, which means a sound mind. Be on the alert because your adversary, your real enemy, the devil, he prowls about like a roaring lion. By the way, the only thing that Satan can do is roar because he cannot bite. He has no teeth. Dr. Jesus, as a dentist, took out his teeth. Therefore, be of a sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And how does he devour us? By negative volition. He devours us by making us doubt and live in fear. But resist him by being firm in your what? In your pistis, your doctrine. Knowing that, and here's what I love, now, look, look at verse 9, I love it. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering that you're going through, and I'm going through, we all go through, they're being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Meaning that what we go through, there's other people that are going through the same thing. Remember that. We're not going through something that no one else has ever gone through. Whatever we go through, remember there's a whole group of people thousands of them who are going through exactly what you're going through, join the party. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will perfect you. That means he'll mature you. He'll perfect you. And notice that the God of all glory will not only perfect you, he will confirm he will show other people and yourself that you are on the right track. He will also strengthen you and he will establish you. He'll make you stable. To him be dominion and forever and ever. Amen. You see, again, this means that if you are dissatisfied about your present situation, you forget that other people just like you and just like me have gone through the same exact thing. The same exact thing they went through in their past. You know, the past always looks good for dissatisfied people, doesn't it? Whether or not it's true, that's not the point. People always are used to that proverb. Remember that you've heard it before, the grass is always greener on the what? The other side. We forget what it was like in the past. And a lot of people use that proverb to actually say the things are, that other people are going through and the situations that they're going through are a lot easier than what we go through. That's not true. 
It looks a lot better than what we're going through, but that's not really the issue. The issue is that we're not going through anything else that our brethren have not gone through. You see, when we understand what it is to think with God and how we need to cleanse our memory, all of us, listen to me carefully now, all of us have skeletons in our closet, don't we? We have things that we did that we don't want to be reminded of. We have things that we said that we don't want to be reminded of. We all want to be uh, relieved from thinking about those areas and those things in our life where we have failed God totally. But you know, memory is a gift from God. And memory has a way of filtering out the bad things. Memory says, I'm going to filter out the bad things about the past and cause us to think that things were not really like they seem. Memory sometimes is good. Memory says, you know what? Things are not always what they seem. Things are not always what they seem, are they? Sometimes things seem one way and they end up another. Good illustration, the Patriot game on Sunday. It seemed like they were what? Defeated. And what happened? They were victorious. In fact, as I mentioned to you on, uh, I think it was Wednesday evening, how some people were rejoicing about the fact that they were not Patriot fans and they were rejoicing about the fact that they thought the Patriots were losing. But the Bible says, do not rejoice in another man's failure, lest God see it and turn his back upon those people and put those things upon you. Memory is a great principle. That's why when you understand what memory is all about, you understand the blessing of memory. Then you think about one thing that we saw on Sunday morning where the Lord Jesus Christ said, in your memory, keep on doing this in remembrance of me. Keep on being reminded about what I've done for you. So you, you can look back, you can talk about the good old days. How many of us talk about the good old days? I, always, I think about the good old days and I said, oh, I remember those days when I had this and I had that and I had these blessings and I could do whatever I want and I drove around in my car late at night and I listened to my fine stereo system. Oh, well, those are the good old days. Yeah, those are the days when I was digging a, a deep well for myself, a ditch where I, if I had to do it over again, I said, never do it. But it was good at the time, wasn't it? Because, oh, by the way, doesn't, uh, Pastor, I mean, Father Dave, doesn't sin give us pleasure for a season? Absolutely. Ask Father Dave. He knows that more than anyone. I mean, you can't keep on going to Cancun unless you understand that sin gives you pleasure for a season. That's why his greatest problem solving device is rebound, Cancun, rebound, Cancun, rebound. And I admire him for that. But you see, you look back sometimes, you talk about the good old days, you forget all about the bad things. Because the past always looks better sometimes, doesn't it? Because we can remember the bad things. Right, Bill? Deacon Bill? We remember the bad things, but we have a difficult time remembering the good things. We got 90 bad things, but we got one good thing, when in reality, it's really the opposite because he's always been with us and we're still here. Do you like where you are right now? Do you like who you are right now? Do you like what you have right now? Then why do you complain about where you are and who you are and what you are and what you have? Most of you, I'm not teaching this to you at all. I'm teaching this to people that go in the opposite direction. But it happens all the time. It's a part of the function of the old sin nature. I want you to notice what happened to the Jews. Go back to Numbers 11 and look at verses 5 through 6. We'll go forward. I want you to see what they said about their memory. The Jews said this in Numbers 11:5. The first thing they said, as it goes along with our subject, they said in Numbers 11.5, are you there yet? Say amen, buddy. We what? We remember. What are they remembering? They're recalling what they had when they were in Egypt as slaves. And they said to Moses and Aaron, listen, we want to go back there because we remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. Now, did they actually eat fish free in Egypt? 
They were what in Egypt? Slaves. They, were, they didn't eat fish for free. They had worked for that fish over and over and over again. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. We remember the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. They forgot the field mice. They forgot the rats. They forgot the cats. They forgot the dogs. They forgot the lice. They forgot the maggots. Gross, huh? Things always seem better when you look at it from the future and you look at it and you say the past was much better. How soon we forget, verse 6, and notice what they say because it's very interesting in the Hebrew. We remember the fish in verse 5, which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our appetite is what? Is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna, this provision from God, this angel's food from above, angel's food from heaven. It was not good enough for them, good enough for the angels, but it's apparently not for the Jews. How soon we forget. Proverbs 26, 11 puts it like this, like a dog that returns to its vomit, Peter put it another way. We'll see that in a second. But, Peter, but uh, Proverbs, uh, Solomon said, like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his what? Folly, his foolishness. The Apostle Peter, 2 Peter 2.22, it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow, a pig, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Notice what they said in verse 5. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. They said about this food that it was free. And by the way, who else said this? Does this remind you of a passage? Uh, does this remind you of a passage of a group of individuals who said they were free and they were not? Anyone? Go to the gospel. This is why I repeat. Go to the Gospel of John for a second, John chapter 8. Because the Pharisees told the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ that we're not in slavery to anyone, Jesus, when they were enslaved to the Romans. Now do you remember? And so they, notice what they said back in Numbers 11 to 5. They said this food was free. Who said this? The Jewish slaves who were anything but free. They're, they were irrational. And by the way, notice that everything they say doesn't make sense. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. The, and this is happening to certain people that are in positions of authority in our own nation. And hopefully those individuals that have this problem will recover. But there's a major problem about, uh, among people who have positions of authority in our nation right now. Arrogance makes you stupid. Repeat. Arrogance makes you stupid. Obadiah 1.3. The arrogance of your heart does what? It has what? Deceived you. Whenever we become arrogant in our right lobe, we become under deception. Jeremiah 28, 48 and 29. Jeremiah said, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, talking about the people of Moab, of his haughtiness, his pride, his arrogance, his self-exaltation. Moab thought that he was becoming very successful in the Middle East, and he was not, or they were not, the people of Moab. He says, I know his fury, the Lord says, declares the Lord, but it is futile. His idle boasts, uh, his idle boasts have accomplished absolutely what? Nothing. They were slaves and they did not even know that they were not free. They thought they were free, but they were slaves. That's what happens to a lot of God's people. We think that we're free. We think that we've got everything under control. But in reality, we are nothing more than being in bondage. But we don't know it because we are arrogant. We are implacable, impossible to satisfy. We have no idea how to get out of the jam that we have put ourselves in. You look at John 8, verse 30. The same thing happened to the Pharisees when the Pharisees said to the Lord Jesus Christ in John 8, while they were slaves into the Romans, it says in John 8, 30. Are you there? As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. 
The Lord is speaking to the crowd, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and also disciples and individuals that were uh, citizens of Israel. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, he's speaking to the Jews now, if you abide in my word, then you are truly what of mine? Disciples, students of mine, you shall know the truth. The truth will make you free. They answered him and said, listen, we're Abraham's offspring and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Here's a group of people. Were they enslaved in Psalm 119? Were they? Were they enslaved in the Old Testament when the Egyptians had them in slavery? What are they saying? We've never been enslaved to anyone. They're proud. They're arrogant. They're dumb. They forget. They're implacable what they have gone through. We are Abraham's offspring. We've never yet been enslaved to anyone. That's a liar. lie. How is it that you say, Jesus, you shall become free? Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin, that means living a lifestyle, is the slave of what? slave of sin and the slave does not remain in the house forever but the son does remain forever if you're a slave you're going to be kicked out if you're a son you're going to be there forever if therefore the son shall make you free you shall be free what indeed then he said i know that you are abraham's offspring yet you pharisees sadducees are seeking to kill me why because my doctrine has no place in you I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you have heard from your father. Isn't that interesting? Notice what he says. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Who's the Lord's father? God, the father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. Who's their father? Look at John 8, 44. Who's their father? Look at it. Don't look at me, look at it. Who's their father? The devil. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, you would do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me. The deeds of Abraham is simply believe and have faith. But you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth. I've told you the truth, the Lord said, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. Notice, notice what he says, this Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father, your father, the devil. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. And because they knew that Jesus did not have an earthly father, they knew that Mary was pregnant before Joseph married her. We were not born of fornication, they said. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Notice. If God's your father, you're going to love God. I proceeded forth and have come from God. And I have set not even, I, and I have not even come on my own initiative, but he, God the Father, has sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? I'll tell you why. It's because you cannot hear what? My word. You are of. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ saying to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious crowd, you are of your father who? The devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer, the devil was, from the beginning when he motivated Cain to kill Abel. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature because your father, the devil, is a liar and the father of lies. Now go back to Numbers 11.5. We've got 15 more minutes, and I'm going to give you some great principles. Hopefully, if we can get to Proverbs 23, when I actually um, give you an impression or reveal to you one of the main principles of those who have negative volition toward doctrine. Numbers 11.5, we remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. We remember the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. You see to them, they did not remember the manna, did they? No, they don't remember the blessing of God, the provisions of God, all it is that God has done. They're remembering what they had in Egypt. They wanted what Egypt or the world could give. What do you want? 
Do you want what the world can give? Do you want what Egypt or the world can give? Or do you want what God gives? And if God gives you suffering, are you willing to accept it? So in, never, in Numbers 11, 5, I want you to see what happens to these people. Because it's happened to you. Some of you here this evening, it happens to me. I know it happened to you because it happens to me. It happens to all of us. Notice what they said. But our appetite is what? What is this? Did your Bible say the appetite is gone? Now, there's more to this in the original Hebrew because the word for appetite is nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, which means soul. It's a perfect description of these negative individuals. There is soul, they have a soul, and their soul is actually gone. It's dried up. What's happened to them? They've lost that love. Remember that first love that you had that the, uh, the believers at Ephesus lost when the Lord said, return to your first love? They lost it. So they said in verse 6, but now our appetite or our soul is gone. There's nothing at all to look at except this stupid what? I didn't, they didn't say stupid, but they meant that, this manner. Isn't it something how the Lord puts us in certain situations where there's nothing to look at except manna. And what does the manna represent? His food from heaven, Bible doctrine. And God says, nothing to look at but this. What are you going to look at? What are you going to eat? The food of the cosmic system? The food of Egypt? Or the food of the word of God? Deuteronomy 8.3 says, my doctrine will come down from heaven like food. We'll see that when we close. I don't, know if you're, I don't know if I'm getting old or just in love with the simplicity of the word of God, but when you start to become dull, you start missing out on what we call the treasures that are found within us. You know, Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians 4.7, we have a treasure in earthen vessels, right? Do you have an earthen vessel? It's your body. Do you have a treasure? Jesus Christ lives where? In you. You have a treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Look at Colossians. Go forward now to Colossians 2. Look at verse 1. I know I'm taking you around, but this is good. Wait to see where we end up if we get that far. But look at Colossians 2, where Paul talked about the fact that we have a treasure in us never to forget. Because when we do, we miss out on the manna from heaven and we eat the garbage of the cosmic system. We're the dog that goes back to what? The what? The vomit. Here's what Paul said, and by the way, when he said this, he's going to say this to the Laodicean church. Colossians 2, verse 1 is where we are. He says this to the lukewarm believers in Laodicea. He says in Colossians 2.1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea, not just for the Colossian church, but next to Colossae was the Laodicean church. He says, I have a struggle for you and for those who are at Laodicea and for those who have not personally seen my what? Seen my face. The apostle Paul was an apostle, was a a uh, pastor, teacher, or a communicator of doctrine to those who had not personally seen his what? Face. Now, we have members right now of the, uh, of the body of Christ. We have what we call our face-to-face -face congregation and our non-face-to-face -face congregation, right? Now, there was a time that they never saw my face. They heard my voice through tapes. Now, because of technology, they can see my face, right? but they're just as much members of our local assembly than you are. Amen? Because they're our non-face-to-face -face congregation. They're with us. Paul said, I'm with all of those who have not personally seen my face. You didn't see my face. And Paul said, it doesn't matter if you see my face. What matters is if you hear my what? My voice, my word. That's right. That's why you always have to look at it's not the man, it's the message. People can't stand Donald Trump. I understand that as a president. Has he done things in a way that I disagree with? Yes. But I'm looking at the message, not the man. 
And I thank God that we have someone in office right now that in spite of what people think, at least I agree with many of the parts of his message than worrying about the fact that if someone else got in who may have had a prettier face, but would have destroyed our country. It's not the man, it's the message. Paul says this, again, I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are laid to see her, and what I struggle for those who have not personally seen my face. This is dedicated to those on the internet ministry right now that you've never been face to face with me, and you can see my face through the internet, or maybe you're just hearing my voice. Thank you, because without you, we would not be Grace Bible Church and Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries, and we give you a round of applause. When we have a need, it doesn't just come from those that are here, it comes from those that are worldwide. And notice what he said, I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and I have a struggle for those who have not personally seen my face, because he's in prison when he writes this, that their hearts may be what? Encouraged. I want you to be encouraged. Having been knit together in agape love, attaining to all the, what's the next word? Wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding the doctrine, resulting in not a true knowledge, the Greek says, an epinosis knowledge, metabolized doctrine of God's what? Mystery, mystery doctrine. And that is Christ himself living inside of us, in whom are hidden all the what? Treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Notice again, we have a treasure. Don't get familiar with that. The Jews got familiar with that. They, every day when they woke up, they said to themselves, wow, there's a manna coming from heaven. The majority said, what is it? What is it? Manu, Manu, what is it? What is it? It's the food of angels. But you're implacable. You want something else. He's going to give it to you before this uh, service is over, I think. The apostle uh, Paul said to Timothy, I want you to God by means of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? Where? In us. Does he dwell in the Old Testament saints? No. He says, God, through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Back in Numbers 11.5, in closing now. Here's where we're going to see spiritual anorexia. <laughs> You don't even laugh at that. I can't believe you Friday night people. Come on, spiritual anorexia, what is that? Well, just think about it. Do some correlation. Use your brain. Verse 5, we remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, lie. We remember the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, forgetting about the rats and the mice and the lice and the, uh, all the other disgusting things that they put in the soup. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing you ought to look at except this what? Manna. And God says, you know what? Deuteronomy 32, 2 puts it like this. My doctrine will drop as with the rain. And every day they went out, they saw doctrine dropping as rain from above. And they said, oh, praise the Lord. Isn't God so great? Or did they say, we want quails. And God says, you want quails? Well, I'm about to give you some. It's going to be about seven feet high, by the way. Well, wait till you see it. I don't want to get into it now, but they're going to be, this is going to be, when they walked out of their tent, they had to like go like this to push the quails aside because sometimes God says, you want it, you got it. You can have it. You, if you want it, you can have it if you want it. And boy, did God give them some quails. And it wasn't Dan. It was quails. So, again, their appetite refers to their capacity. That for their appetite and their capacity for food is now gone. They now have physical anorexia because they had spiritual anorexia. What is spiritual anorexia? Spiritual anorexia means that you vomit out the word of God. Just like God vomits you out when you're lukewarm. It's a lack of a desire. They, went, they finally arrived at a place where it happens to you. This is what I don't want to happen to any of you. Someday when you keep on rejecting the word of God, God says, I'm going to knock on the door. He promises, I'll knock on the door. Open up your heart before that knock gets weaker. I'm knocking on the door. 
I'm knocking on the door. Are you listening? It's gone. What happened? Spiritual anorexia. And all of a sudden, the desire for doctrine based upon the amount of trash in your soul combined with the function of the old sin nature is gone. They are now petty. They are bitter. They're implacable. They are dishonest. The only, the, they say one thing, but they mean another. And by the way, this is what I'll close with. Good place to close right here. I'm glad I got this far. Solomon said it like this in Proverbs 23, 7. Be careful. You've heard this before, but I want you to look at it not in the positive way, because we always talk about the positive way, because the positive way talks about where our heart is. But Solomon said, for as a person thinks within himself, so he is. How many times have you heard that? That you are what you think, right? It's true. As he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and what? Drink. Amen. But his heart, or her emotional jealousy, vindictive, revengeful heart is not with you. Why do I say this? Look at Proverbs 23.1 as we close. I dedicate this to those of you who have been deceived and are being deceived and are listening to the wrong people. You're listening to women you should never listen to. Men you should never listen to. People who are negative toward the word of God you should never listen to. These are people designed to destroy the word of God. They don't care about the fact that Jesus said, well, if you're not against me, you're with me. They say, well, if you're not with me, you're against me. You got to do things their way. These people have no idea that they are attacking the people of God who are trying to do their best to go forward in the plan. Can I ask you a question? Why is it that there are people in our lives, family members or so-called loved ones or people we used to know who are dedicated to try to stop us from going forward? Why don't they just mind their own business, find their own church, work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, and leave us alone? Right? I mean, can't they find something better to do? Is their life so boring that they got to attack Bob McLaughlin, Grace Bible Church, Robert Tavares, Bill Tuck, John Medeiros, the whole body of Christ? Is that what they have to do? Their life is that boring and that dull? Yes, it is. So instead of saying, forget about those people, I'm going forward in the plan, they're dedicated to try to destroy us. Solomon warned us about this. Look at Proverbs 23.1. Here's the guidance, and this is called the book of wisdom, by the way, not just the book of Proverbs. When you sit down to dine with a ruler, you got that? Proverbs 23.1, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, someone who has some position of authority or think that they do, Consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are a man of a great appetite. If you're saying, well, I'm hungry and I trust this person and I can't wait to have dinner with them. In other words, do not be so selfish and self-centered that you dine into the, that you draw, that you dive into the food that's placed before you and do not guard your heart from the trap that is being set. Did you listen? Repeat. Do not be so selfish and self-centered that you dive into the food that is being placed before you and you don't guard your heart from the trap that is being set. Therefore, verse 3 says, do not desire his or her what? Delicacies. They say, I got something good for you. For it is what kind of food? Deceptive food. It's not a manna from heaven. Oh, they say, I love you, I'll be there for you, I'll never forsake you. And they deceive you with their delicacies. They say good things about you in front of you, but when you turn your back, it's bam, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Operation Screwball. Do not weary yourself to gain what? Wealth, verse 4. Don't be occupied with them. It's a trap. Don't be occupied with them when they try to offer you something. Cease from your consideration of it. It's a trap. Don't let them buy you with their time, their talent, their treasure, and their compliments. When you set your eyes on it, whatever it may be, like wealth, it is gone. 
because wealth certainly makes itself wings. We all know that. We get more money. First thing that happens, it makes itself wings and has to go to all the kind of things that we didn't uh, think that we had to pay for. Like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. You may have some wealth today, but like an eagle, it flies away. Now look at verse 6, and we're dealing with context now. Do not eat the bread of a selfish person. Do not desire their delicacies. When you know someone is selfish, don't, don't dine with them. Stay away from them. Solomon says separate yourself from them. Because you will, verse in verse 8, forget about verse 7, that a man thinks in his heart, but in verse 8 it says, you will vomit up the morsel you have eaten. Do you see that? You vomit up what? The morsel you have eaten. You waste your compliments. What does that mean? Well, again, in verse 6 it says, do not eat the bread of a selfish person or desire their delicacies, because as they think within themselves, so are they. They say to you, eat and what? Eat and what? Drink. But their heart, their emotional jealousy, their vindictive, revengeful heart is not with you. Oh, by the way, when you eat with them, you vomit up the morsel you have eaten. You'll waste your compliments. You think you're complimenting them, and meanwhile, you're falling into their trap. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool. They're not going to listen to your doctrine. They would despise the wisdom of your words because they secretly despise you. Remember, when people despise you, they despise what they say, what you say. No matter what, if it may be words of wisdom, it doesn't matter. You will expose them. You will give them over to the Supreme Court of Heaven if you're smart. Verse 10, do not move, do not move the ancient boundary. You know what that means? Don't let them take you away from the old doctrines, like rebound. How many, time, how many years have we taught rebound? Over 30 years, right? There are people that are going to try to take you away from the ancient boundaries, from the old doctrines, from the justification, the glorification, from the angelic conflict. They're going to say, those things don't matter. McLaughlin came up with that. Thien came up with that. Schaefer came up with that. But we now have new doctrine. Oh, do not move the ancient boundary or go into the fields of the fatherless. In other words, don't fall away from the old ways and the old doctrines that you've been established in. For their Redeemer is strong, notice that. He will plead their case against you, meaning give it over to the Supreme Court of Heaven because the same Redeemer you have is the same Redeemer they have. Don't get involved with the judgment. That is, if you judge them as they, as they are doing to you, you're going to realize that their Redeemer is just as strong. God is not a respecter of persons. Don't get involved in the nonsense and say, well, I'm going to deal with them. No, let God deal with them. Their Redeemer is strong because their Redeemer is your Redeemer, and he doesn't take sides. And so apply your heart to what in verse 12? To discipline and apply your ears to words of knowledge. What is Solomon saying in this entire chapter? Don't let people, by their so-called love, take you away from the truth of what God is providing for you. Do not become implacable. What happened to the Jewish people? They forgot about the blessing of God. They forgot about the manna from above. They forgot all it was that God had provided because they were so occupied with that which they wanted. And we'll see on Sunday morning how God said, well, what you want, I'm going to give you because there comes a time when God keeps warning us not to go in a certain direction. And if we keep on saying no, he finally says, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. And hopefully that will wake you up to rebound and recover before it's too late. Take these words as words of strength, words that are very serious, because what I said is not a gimmick. It's not a game. It's not a reaction. It's Bible doctrine resonant in my soul passing down to you in your soul so that you don't get involved with all the nonsense and the evil that comes from Satan, the kingdom of darkness, whose one goal is to do what's happening to the patriots right now. When some people want to go to the White House and some say we're not going to the White House, what's Satan's goal? Divide. I know sports is a bad illustration for some, 
but Satan's one number one goal, divide. Divide the local assembly, divide the church of Jesus Christ, stop Grace Bible Church from going forward, and need I say, you cannot do that, because it's greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, and no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper, but God will always give us the victory through us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Thank you, Father, for the privilege you've given us again to gather together to study your word. May we never get familiar with your manna from heaven. May we never become implacable and thank you for all of these that you've given to us. For we ask it in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.